So when you do a conversion, sometimes you have to accept compromises in the design. And one of them was that uh, for the aviation fuel tanks, apparently were not, um, I'm not sure, I'm, just, I'm sorry, forgive me, I'm looking for the right word. I'm, I want to say cushioned, but that's not the right word, but they were weren't part protected of the enough from a, from a hit. Um, they weren't they weren't protected from you know the shock damage and when they were rebuilt in the 30s that deficiency wasn't rectified and so when the bomb hit there was some shock damage that you know caused some of the, the tankage to rupture which you know added to the conflagration that destroyed the ship um, the magazines were probably if I had to guess I would say we probably were adapted from the the original design and were probably um, in the same area that uh, would have been for the, um, the battle cruiser design. So they would have been deep in the hull, probably below the water line for added protection. Yeah. But um, don't really know precisely where. And of course, the, the enclosed hangars didn't take the full beam of the space of the ship, and so there were compartments on either side and with substantial you know um, structure substantial walls and there's storage all throughout those I imagine as well but they weren't the hangars weren't armored I don't believe they were armored so the hangars were not armored um, the Brit British Royal Navy were the only ones that had armored carriers during uh, World War two um, the Japanese did build one carrier during the war, Taiho, which did have an armored flight deck. Um, but, uh, you know, she was completed too late in the war, and, you know, her, she was sunk by submarine torpedoes and uh, bad damage control. We're still trying to figure out what those troughs were for on both of the edges there. Can we zoom there? Sure. Yeah, we're moving that way. Let's try 10 north, man. Yeah. Ten at zero 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 or three six zero. Do north. It's not a bent stanchion or railing. Go ahead, Jane. You can zoom in there. Push in just a bit for us. When we saw it from the side perspective, it's clearly a trough. This, on the starboard side, you can actually see what appears to be a drain. It's not as pre uh, clear on the port side at the moment. Oh, I see. You're talking about the, the trough. Yeah. Hans, have we, uh, we've previously been around the stern? Yeah, we're just taking a look at this. I think you probably had shots dead on at the stern, I imagine, on the last watch. I don't know. I wasn't watching. Yeah. I was sleeping. Can we zoom here? Yeah. Yeah, it almost looks like a scupper lining that's bent. Yeah, Hans, you can see some rollers there too. 
Yeah. I wonder if that top roller that's laterally configured, you know, horizontal, if that was a, a roller as well, if it's just a two on the side. That's a big change that's going through there. Looking at that cable and going through the, the the hole there, we were just kind of speculating, you know, whether that was part of a possible repair party action, trying to control the damaged rudder. That's an interesting suggestion. I thought I read the rudder was jammed 30 degrees to starboard, but I don't remember. Yeah, something like that. I read same. What I'd like to do is move 10 meters off of the stern and then um, drop down to a safe elevation yeah, off I of the silt and use the sonar to take a look around and see what's in our way from our next heading. Roger that. We're headed north as we speak. Did they get a look at the runner, or is it, you, you don't know, you were sleeping yeah, as well? Yeah, I don't know. Shore team, Phil, are you still up? Did you folks see the mud line at the stern and, and the rudder or propellers? The hull was buried, um, so you can't see the rudder or the prop. Oh, that's right. The mud was at a, at a considerable level. Yeah, we were able to make out the... Um, Paragonal letters, uh, characters that you know, clearly identify the, the vessel as a coggy. I'm going to spin around here, Hans. And everything kind of below that good. is in the mud, unfortunately. But looking at this same area from this bird's eye perspective, though, has is, is, uh, been really helpful to us. We really appreciate this. That Atlanta was built for, bird's eye view. Adding on to that for the new viewers just joining, asking why um, we are using Atalanta instead of Hercules. Um, we are extremely deep right now, over 5,000 meters, and uh, Hercules is only rated to 4,000 meters. So we are using Atalanta for this particular dive. Yep, it gives us the ability to do a very slow and careful survey, but it does mean that it takes patience and time to
transition. Maybe we could upgrade Hercules to 6,000 meters and come back here next year. Time and money. Above my pay grade to speculate. <laughs> if I had to throw out a number, I'd say uh, 10 million in a year. New RLV in a year to build it. I could hit the <coughs> buy it now button and that's about what I want. Uh, you would need uh, a little more than just upgrading Hercules. You know, probably to bigger cable, bigger winch, bigger launch recovery system. And of course, you need a bigger boat, so might add tack a zero onto that 10 million scope creep. Yeah, the biggest limiting factors on the current vehicle are the uh, the electronics bottle on the uh, the buoyancy block. Hans, can you remind me how uh, big this the ship is? How long? 855 feet, 260 meters. And how does that compare to the Nautilus? Four Nautiluses. Is it four Nautiluses? Nautilus is 68 meters long and 10 meters wide. Or 11 meters wide, something like that. Takes me a minute to walk from port to starboard. Mm -hmm. But I only move at point three of a knot. <laughs> Is uh, that the anchor no, down there? That does appear to be the anchor. I imagine they saw it the first time around. Obviously, the big, big obvious anchor here. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah, you folks saw it first time around, yeah? But, you know, this is a better view, to be honest. We, we were a little side shot and seeing it overhead and seeing that depression. Understandable. How many anchors underwater do you think you've seen in your career, Phil? <laughs> the Great Lakes? A few. <laughs> hard, hard to count, right? Yeah. I know. How about you, Han? <laughs> you know, I've always wanted to come out with that big coffee table book, Anchors I've Seen. They're, they're ubiquitous. Well, you we can add this one to the collection. Can you possibly zoom in on the upper left quadrant here alongside the stern. I was kind of curious if that little um, maybe part of one of the props sticking out of the silt. Dan, can we pan yeah, up a bit and yeah, yeah, look to the here. left? A little to the, a little to the left, there's like a... Yeah, I see what you mean. A little, I wonder if that's a couple of the prop blades sticking out. What do you think? Go ahead, it's not Jenny. a very clear image here, so I could just be looking at dirt, but uh, it looks like there's um, a couple of prop blades sticking out. Or maybe on the right side. And on the right side, too. A better angle on the right side. Yeah. Not sure yet. 
to the quadruple screw vessel. So we can zoom there. Four props. Go ahead, Janet. Zoom in there real quick. I'm going to look at the other side. Can't really tell. Yeah, we'll have to tilt up all the way. Uh, you'll lose the light there. Yeah, we'll lose the light. For this big a ship, how big are these uh, props? Line, please. I'm not sure what the diameter is. I yeah. think they were three bladed propellers, though. If we begin to move around the right side from our perspective, which is what we're going to do, correct, Mia? Yeah, I was just going to ask. We were, if you wanted there. to go down the starboard side, um, yeah, to check that, for that debris. This that's, is, a, that's the plan, debris yeah. on the starboard side. We could then be we'll looking back open at the iris a bit while you're zoomed what in that there. possible prop might be. Of course, we don't want to get too close to the hull or anything, but. Yeah. I'll, Okay, we can go away. Let me confer with Dan about yeah. positioning safely. We'll stay up above the silt so we don't bounce up and down and kick too much of it up. But, I mean, we're uh, six, six meters up right now. Oh, that's good. Let me uh, just start to stir it up. Five yeah, or six I think meters if we up. were... Can we get a zoom on the anchor there while we're here? Sure. Go ahead, Janet. Just partial zoom there. One. Well, that's the shackle, and there's no chain. I don't think there's a chain. It's kind of a few seconds of video here, and then we'll... <coughs> um. second we'll, we'll turn our head and have a look okay you can uh, go wide there and some letters on the right side there or no I know they saw lettering at the stern. I don't know which side they saw it on. Maybe both. Uh, I'm going to turn my head in just to work out. Uh, um, according to my notes here, it seems like on the starboard side, they saw the embossed name okay. um, that seemed painted over. And then on the port side, um, they saw a paint of the possible name. But it didn't seem too clear on either side. Thank but, you. Yeah. Yeah, we'll want to begin to move to the debris field, but right here would be nice to be like 10 meters out and we can yeah, see if I'm a prop is there. Trying to uh, work out a heading here with my sonar. Okay, we'll stand by. Uh, Upasana, um if we look at this sediment and we see kind of that like texture with the little um, raised portions, like a little bit darker, do you think that is um, a result from like bioturbators, like mm -hmm. sea cucumbers or animal, uh, other animals in the sediment um, stirring it over or affecting it or creating that texture at all? Or is that just something geological? Uh, it can be both honestly because uh bioturbation uh due to uh deposit okay, feeders is definitely a factor but mm -hmm. given the uh 
10 meters at 210. Structure please. of it, it kind of also seems geologic. So, because, uh, yeah, I can't exactly explain, but given the shape, the size, it can be geologic features as well, or a combination of both. Gotcha, yeah, thank you. Um, and for any of the audience wondering, uh, bioturbators are basically organisms that uh, live in the sediment and then they might mix it around, like turbation basically, um, and that can do things in the sediment like introduce nutrients or affect uh, the chemistry um, due to those actions of mixing that sediment around. Just for your awareness, science, uh, we just called in a 10 meter move bearing 210. Thank you. And we had a question asking about um, kind of the status of um, whether we know where the different wrecks uh, involved in the Battle of Midway, um, whether we know their location. So yesterday we did um, a dive on USS Yorktown, so you can find highlights, uh, highlight uh, photos of that on our Instagram page. Um, we are currently diving on uh, the Japanese aircraft carrier Akagi, uh, which was the flagship uh, for Japan's first air fleet. Um, both Akagi and Kaga were found by a team in 2019 led by Vulcan Inc. and the U.S. Navy that conducted high-resolution mapping surveys on the research vessel Petrol. Um, and those uh, research surveys helped uh, identify the approximate uh, believed locations. And then we confirmed uh, the ID for Akagi during this dive. And then for uh, the other two aircraft carriers, Hiryu and Soryu, that were part of that fleet, um, the final resting places of those aircraft carriers are still not known. Um, so that is a little bit of the status of um, the different aircraft carriers involved in this battle and what we know about their location so far. Yeah, short team, we're, you know, changing directions, so it's taking a little time to bring Atalanta around, but we'll be going down the starboard side and getting, a, I think, a good angle on where that prop might be, and we'll take a close look when we get over there. Yeah, we, oh, we might have to do a couple moves here, Hans. The uh, Atalanta is uh, a bit unpredictable when we change directions like this. 
Yeah, I just called in a 10 meter move, bearing 210. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, that's a real consideration when maneuvering close to wrecks with a tow sled. Changing direction makes it a little bit squirrely. If you took the 6-8 uh, cable diameter and reduced it to the diameter of a uh, angel hair pasta, how long, how long and so if you scale the diameter down, how long would the uh, angel hair pasta have to be? <laughs> Are you on SPL? I am, yeah. <laughs> and I'll leave that up to the shore team. First question will be, what's the diameter of angel hair pasta? <laughs> it's uh, too early in the morning to be doing math. <laughs> Somebody out there listening can work that out in their head. And we have some viewers that are either just tuning in or uh, had to take a break earlier. Um, there was a question, is the chrysanthemum figurehead still visible on the bow? And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe hearing updates before that they did see some like ridges indicating um, that chrysanthemum figurehead, is that correct? That's going to make a really interesting image to review because initially it looked like the teakwood figurehead, well, not really figurehead, the chrysanthemum emblem was not there. On closer inspection, I thought I was seeing some kind of translucent shield over what looked like behind that, the chrysanthemum pattern. It's fascinating. And I thought we were seeing some reflection off of that translucent shield. So it'll take some, some closer uh, study of that, but maybe that is the case there was some sort of protective shield and it's still there i i, I can't see either way what well, uh, what's the uh well thanks for that update Hans. i missed that part of the story yeah the the chrysanthemum emblem is on the very bow the very prow of the ship and it's the emblem of the emperor so this is mm -hmm. the emperor's ship Imperial ship. I think we wait. <clears throat> Dan, there's a question in the chat. What is the diameter of the six to eight cable? <laughs> the diameter of the 6-8 cable is 0 decimal 6-8 in uh, inches. 
Okay, so. That's why we call it the 68. Technically, it's a uh, zero decimal 681. But we are, uh, it sounds way better when you say 68. <laughs> Okay, so listeners, there's another part of the math problem for you. I didn't hear what prize was being offered, Dan. I've <laughs> uh, gotten in trouble before for uh, offering prizes for math questions. So. Can you um, zoom in on our trajectory there and make any sense of our blue dot trail? We're going to have to get a little more uh, aggressive to the um, to the southwest there. We did two one zero there, and we seem to be going uh, directly south. So. Hmm. Let me see if I can uh, co convince that Alonso to slide over a bit here. The comments are have a lot of comments on. Uh, noting things about noodles now <laughs> and angel hair pasta but on a related note um, asking about this cable and since we are going to such uh, great depths um, almost three miles or over 5,000 meters uh, we had a viewer asking what kind of uh, maintenance or um, work on this cable occurs to ensure that it can um, continue to support the ROV at such depths? Do you often have to replace it or do testing or other maintenance? Um, maybe uh, Jacob or Dan, you could help answer that if you're not too busy. Yeah, we are. Uh, good question. Thank you. We are uh, bumping 15,000 pounds at the moment, uh, hanging off the stern of the ship. So one of the big screens we have up here with the green squiggly line is uh, there's a load cell on the overboarding sheave on Nautilus's A-frame. And the safe working load of the 6-8 of the cable is uh, it's basically 14,000 pounds. And then we have another 1,000 pounds tacked on here for the weight of the uh, overboarding sheave. So. Um, yeah, we're right, right at the max, and uh, to take care of the cable, uh, we uh, we lubricate it every year, and uh, we wash it down with fresh water when it comes back on board. Uh, every year, the end of the cable where it attaches to Atlanta is re-terminated, and uh, we cut off about. 10 meters and uh, go ahead, Mia, you can, or uh, Jaina, there's once. You can try and zoom in there where he circled. 
Uh, we send the piece that's uh, cut off for retermination out for uh, testing. So there's a laboratory that uh, does a pull test, and they pull it to uh, pull it to destruction and give us a report on. the results. That looks like, is that like a pipe? I'm looking for blades. Uh, then after the return, we uh, we do a load test on the, on the new termination. We pull about 12,000 pounds on it, which is uh, three times the weight of Atalanta. To the left there just a bit, Hans? Is yeah. That that, that's good. Shore team, what do you think? Anything there? Starboard side, mud line. I, I don't know that I could confirm seeing blades, but there's a shape. Okay, you can pull out there a bit. To yeah, it looks like other shapes of the substrate sediment. We have a different angle on it now. Can we try that zoom again? Sure. Okay, Jenna, I can push in there. Oh, uh, that'll do. That'll do it. Okay. Thank you. You can pull wide. Right here. All right, Mia, at this point, I know you've got the plan. Just to confirm, we're headed for that point off the starboard side, some 80 meters back along the length of the vessel and about 70 meters perpendicular. Yeah, avoiding uh, what uh, near what we saw coming back on, uh, or coming in on the our first watch. Let me confirm with Dan, and okay. then I'll put get ready to put in a call when he's ready. Thanks. So you want to move straight to the debris field, or do you want to move along the vessel again? Oh, way out there. All right, let's see. Yeah. Right. Well, let's see if I can find a sonar target to look for. Yeah, it sounded from, from Mike's instructions that they had a pretty good look at the starboard side and saw torpedo damage and recorded all of that, so debris field is the next priority for us. Right here. Yeah, give me a second here. Kind of lost the pot here. You're looking for a target 70 meters out, is what you said? There's a, you know, an area of debris that um, begins about 80 meters back along the axis, the long axis of the ship, you know, about a third of the way back. Gotcha. And it looks like it's about 70 meters out and extends outward from there. So the idea is to get to that point and then head parallel to the ship towards its bow and make passes out there in the debris field. And it'll, I know it'll take some time to get there, but that's why we're sitting down. I think we'll be okay. It's uh, only 2.30, so we still have time.
I'm going to come up a bit and just try and uh, light up the edge of the ship there. And And for viewers um, curious about the biology, Upashna, do we know what kind of um, sea anemones these are? Are they common or is there any information or is it just uh, not really possible to do an ID because we're not close enough and not enough information? Um, I'm sure if we have any experts on sea anemones on the chat, they can help us ID them, but uh, no, I cannot, I have, I can only identify okay. them as sea anemones and I'm not beyond two that. One zero there. Uh, but I would say that they're fairly common in enemies. That That is something that I can see. And we did see a squat lobster and some I'm facing 210 well. there and Oh wow! I think Thank maybe you, Pashna. This is the debris they were. I don't think it, that's too far out. That's that's like hundred meters away out there. So uh, if we go basically two ten, two one five, will put us. Uh, in theory, right out here, and that'll be about uh, 40 meters from the stern and maybe 20 meters out at that point, and then we can uh, reevaluate. Uh, no, let's do 40 meters on, on the setting. So. Sure. Okay, Hans, we're going to um, do a 40 meter step at 215 bearing. Thank you. That should put us uh, here, Hans. All right, will you see my wiggling my mouse yep. around on yep. the sonar? And then we will go outboard from there? Yeah, that's. Uh, there's uh, some debris hanging out here that's lighting up pretty good. Yeah. That's the only, uh, and then I'm getting some returns, uh, about 60 meters out there, some debris, but we'll get a better, uh, sonar target once I get away from the hole, it'll, we can drop down and yeah, uh, get a better uh, sonar yeah. scan on any possible targets out there. Yeah, and the sonar, I'm looking at the image, I don't see big targets closer into the ship, I see them starting maybe 70 meters yeah, normal perpendicular from the ship. I'm out. not seeing any at the moment from here, but... But uh, yeah, yeah, maybe if we get I'm down there and... Yeah. It's uh, likely that we're, we're four meters above the, uh, above the deck here, so all of this is probably shadowing anything that's on the seabed out here. Yeah. Well, we'll get down to that level, you know, some third of the way back along the ship, some yeah. 80 meters, and then we'll start. Yeah, basically if we go halfway, you said it's 80 meters back, so if we go halfway, 40 meters, and I can, uh, then I can drop down and we'll, uh, we'll be able to light up anything on the seabed there. Sounds good. What's that? I'm comfortable, but it's now uh, 
69 in here. Are you cold? So we have multiple viewers rejoining us after taking a nap and um, interested uh, in any updates. So yes, this is still the Kagi that we are exploring. Um, question for Hans or anyone who uh, might have been on the previous watches. Have you found any of the mounts that supported the flight deck? Yes, yeah, I think we saw a couple of the pillars or pylons that supported the forward extension of the main flight deck. The part that was added as the renovation when they no longer, you know, were, were able to use the multiple lower decks as flight decks. I think they were relying on the, um, uh, the port side right up at the bow, which is a very interesting place for them because, you know, that's pretty s big structure. It's pretty heavy. Yeah. And um, it's not something that would have come off at the surface and floated down, sunk, because it's probably not going to land right by the bow. But it's not something that would, you know, make it to the bottom intact and then slowly deteriorate and then suddenly fall over like that. So, you know, maybe one of the only hypothetical formation processes is it's damaged structurally in the fire and explosions it's still on the ship then the ship begins to sink and the force of the water damages it further maybe breaks it partially free so it's hanging on by some structure or weakened enough that when the ship does impact the bottom then it finally simply topples over right next to the bow Wow, thank you for that very detailed rundown, uh, run through of what uh, we were seeing with those structural supports. Um, other returning viewers are asking also if there is any signs of aircraft or if that's something that um, we're potentially going to see uh, pieces of in the debris field nearby. That's always a potential, but you know, I think that the majority of the aircraft had flown uh, been used in battle but uh, well no there were aircraft loaded and, and ready to go when it was struck that's right and, and damaged so um, in the effort to save a vessel in that condition they might have jettisoned some we didn't see any aircraft in the hangars or what's left of the hangars the massive destruction really change the nature of the entire right. interior of this aircraft carrier. We didn't see any aircraft inside. There's a possibility that there may be one nearby, but of course the Akagi drifted for overnight and into the hours of the next of the morning of the next day, drifted away from the place where it was attacked. And um, so we wouldn't have seen any of the aircraft that fell in the water from the attack at all. Right, so it could potentially be a, a massive debris field then if it was uh, dropping things while it was drifting away. It could be have dropping them all along, yeah, a trail of debris, a debris trail, as, you, as we say, yeah. I read something about the, the engines mysteriously coming back online for a while and then uh, shutting down again during the night. Is that oh, I'd, I'd have to ask the shoreside experts about that. I, that's beyond me. What's that? Uh, I turned my head in to look in at the... Yeah, and Atalanta can behave completely different when we're moving towards it versus moving away from it on Nautilus. 
snow when we're so you see the offset there is basically what you know 50 meters offset so when we're dragging it as we were moving the other way it will behave differently as opposed to nautilus moving closer to it it's hard to uh, push the spaghetti noodle if you were and then pull on it yeah for folks watching where we've changed direction changed the course of the ship that's pulling Atalanta around and so that makes for slow changes being translated down 5,300 and some meters uh, to the weight at the bottom of the cable and we're in the process of heading uh, towards the bow and away from the starboard side to begin to look at some of the debris field. It'll take a little time to get there at the slow, careful pace that we've been conducting the survey. At the moment, we're moving, uh, basically moving uh, Nautilus towards Atlanta. Uh, it's about 50 meters off the uh, port aft stern of the vessel. So our other moves where we're kind of dragging it along as Atlant or, uh, Nautilus was moving to the northeast. So now we're moving northwest, so it, it's... Uh, can I anybody's guess what Atalanta is going to do? <laughs> I don't know why that 50 meter offset is, you know, probably coming from the current. But who knows yeah. what the uh, can be multi-directional currents as the, you know, through the water column. Yep. Yeah, I think the current's about. It's hard to see, but we're on dark mode, 66 degrees. Um, but. Uh, I just got a text message from my friend Hans, a different Hans than the one on the watch. I believe he studied <laughs> math, and he said the spaghetti noodle would be around 840 feet long. <laughs> it's a lot of spaghetti. That is a lot of spaghetti. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Hans. Thank I am you, Hans. so proud of Hans right now. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him he has to show his work. One of our team members said you needed to show your work, Hans. How long was it again? So one serving then. <laughs> How many meters in eight? Don't give the Italian any ideas. <laughs> How many meters is that, Mia? It's interesting to know what the scale factor would be, too. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't think the boat did, sorry 200 and some it doesn't look like the boat did uh, what we asked it to the boat appears to have moved south well you can see on the nav screen there. So we have to, yeah, compensate. say we need to go west a little to make up for that one. I uh, don't know, just try to try to move to the west. 
two seven zero. Mm. That might be a little far, but sure, yeah, forty meters. See what happens. Bridge nav. Let's do 30. Yeah, uh, can 40 we, feels too long. Uh, right, Roger. Um, can we move 30 meters at a bearing of 270? Yes, thank you very much. You might get the reciprocal view along the flight deck, whether you want it or not, Hans. Right. <coughs> I'll take it. Yeah, we could move on along there and then skirt straight over. We're kind of uh, seem to be heading that way. What did we ask for in the last move? A two one zero. Two one five. Yeah. So we did, uh, what's that there, 20 of it was at our requested heading and the last uh, 10, 15 was, <laughs> you can see it went. question about <clears throat> the difference when it comes to maneuvering just at Atlanta opposed to when it is with Herc. So, um, and if I say anything incorrect, feel free to um, chime in and correct me, ROV team, but usually... Sorry, uh, what, what was the question again? Uh, any difference when it comes to maneuvering just at Atlanta as opposed to with Herc? So normally Herc is attached to Atlant Atalanta and it probably has some more freedom and range of movement because Atalanta is taking um, more of the motion from the ship. As you can see in the camera right now, we're bobbing up and down a bit because Atalanta is directly connected to the ship. Um, but uh, Herc is able to be more steady because it has a separate connection. So they call this the uh, dual body system, I believe. So we still have the the exact same challenges. We we uh, generally do move. Uh, we try and position Atlanta, so we move the ship to put Atlanta in the right spot, uh, so Hercules can uh, do its business. But you don't notice it as much because um, Hercules has that 30 meter tether, and it can zoom around and and oh, basically a 20 meter radius from wherever Atlanta is. So if we miss by, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 meters, we can still fly Hercules over to uh, whatever it is we want to look at. And uh, it just gives us more latitude. And usually we're not uh, this deep. Usually we're like half this deep. So the uh, the kind of the guessing game error rate of what Atlanta might do based on the currents and how fast we move the vessel and uh, how far we move it is not quite, uh, it's a little easier to, to manage. But it does uh, often, Atlanta will have a mind of her own and uh, go on holiday and then uh, we have to, uh, Herc has no choice but to uh, follow along. But we can actually, can and do, uh, drag Atalanta around by its tail. And and we can also um, change the, uh, what we call the delta, so the height of Atalanta up to seabed versus Hercules. Uh, we typically try and stay 20 meters away from Atalanta, so 
if we're under it, we bring Atalanta up a little bit higher to manage our tether. If we're further away, we can get Atalanta closer to the seabed and, and uh, get a little more leash, as we call it. So, you know, if you're walking your dog and uh, you know, give him a little more room to run around. <coughs> A hey, uh, shipboard ECC here, you know, just just off to the right of the image is something I've been looking forward to seeing and figuring out if there were indeed wooden cradles or if these were uh, if these were metal supports that held small boats. And we know that Akagi carried a handful of small boats on the aft deck, but seeing seeing these V-shaped cradles and you know giving <clears throat> giving some perspective on where those small boats would lie is helpful. I don't know if we can pan to the right. We don't need to. I know this is tight here, but it's good to take note. Yeah. yeah, if it's possible, maybe do a light zoom into this area. Yeah. I think push in a bit, Janet. I'm reluctant to uh change the heading too much in here because uh, last time I did that it uh, really stirred up the yeah yeah roger that sounds good that's good thank you We're obviously going to have to come up here pretty quick. It's a pretty um, striking image on the sonar screen there. If you Judge the distance. It's Finally starting to move to the west there a little bit. You saw the move just kick in. It was interesting. We were we were going along the flight deck there, straight as an arrow, and then we've uh, suddenly started moving off to the starboard side there. It does give us a nice view into those compartments between the hangar and the outer hull. Yeah, what I'm attempting to do a run back up the uh, center, huh? Yeah, in the sonar image I'm looking at, the first big debris targets look like they're in a line about 70 meters off the starboard beam. Now I'm looking at this orange sonar image we pulled from the 2019. You want me to show you? A very small 
Okay. Is that a printed image you have, or is that an image on the in the document somewhere? There's a very small version of it in the dive plan. Roger. You have that dive plan over there? The dive plan? Uh, June, just checking in. Any comments on uh, what we've been seeing so far for the past hour or so, or or what you um, are expecting or hoping to see in the debris field as we navigate towards there? Let's try a uh, 2225. Yeah. Yes, please. Bridge nav. Can we please step two zero meters bearing 225? Thank you. A note for biology looked like there was a fish that was in the corner of the screen just now. Not sure if it'll come back into view. It's a top-down scan, so it's hard to say what that is.
Oh, I see. And we had a question earlier about um, whether we will continue exploring uh, shipwrecks. So um, we have about another four hours or so on this particular wreck that we will continue exploring. And um, depending on weather conditions, um, we may continue doing other archaeologically focused dives. Uh, there will be some a bit time to transit, redeploy, and uh, reorganize operations as well. That's good, thanks. Yeah, good recap. Sounds like we did that. And for new viewers, again, asking uh, what we are looking at, we're currently looking at a Japanese aircraft carrier Akagi. Um, there are some questions about the context of this shipwreck. So this was, um, this did sink during the Battle of Midway, um, which occurred approximately six months after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor uh, in 1942. Uh, the Battle of Midway was considered a pretty pivotal naval battle that kind of changed the course for World War II in the Pacific and was a very consequential event during the war. It was um, this, it had a significant loss of life, um, so we do want to um, recognize that this is a very um, uh, sensitive and important site for many people who have family members that maybe were lost here, um, 3,400 3, sailors and airmen, um, and seven large vessels were lost, including Japan's fleet carriers Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu. And the U.S. also um, lost the USS Yorktown, um, along with another destroyer, 
uh, and a heavy cruiser, a Japanese heavy cruiser, were lost. Uh, the battle did encompass a massive ocean area. So for reference, um, we departed Hawaii and have transited for multiple days to get to these wreck sites and have had to trans uh, transit for several hours between Yorktown um, to our site now. Um, so these battles really did take uh, place over really large areas where um, they Which were not really seeing each other and over very deep water that was more than 5,000 meters or 16,000 feet deep. So um, very uh, uh, technically challenging to be viewing these wrecks. And any team members, feel free to step in if uh, this is incorrect information, but I believe what we're looking at right this moment is a gun tub and some rusticles um, coming off of it. Is that true? Looks like it to me. Looks like the, one of the twin pairs of, uh, I think those would be the 25 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Looking back at the ship right now. You can do another uh, 2225 though. There were 14 pairs of those uh, 25 millimeter anti aircraft guns, type 96. Uh, go wide for me for a minute. Thank can, you, Hans. Can we please step two zero meters bearing two two five? Thank you. There's another pair right there. And you're right to point out the rusticles, Kara. I, and if it's not my imagination, I think I'm seeing a lot more rust and corrosion and rustical formation and a more orangey color, which denotes more active corrosion on this wreck than we saw in the Yorktown. I don't know if that's due to the fire damage or a different type of steel used in construction, but it's quite noticeable. Yes, it's giving it yeah. that yellow color, right? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, no, please continue. I was going to mention something about these guns. Yeah, go ahead, Phil. Well, you, you know, Hans, it's, uh, it's pretty Incredible seeing some of these anti-aircraft platforms pointed directly upwards and imagining the dive bombers that that ultimately ended, uh, you know, sealed the fate for Akagi. And we were remarking on that earlier on, on the first pass around this area, how, how that certainly struck a tone with folks and even seeing it seen it coming around a second time. I think it's worth calling out as well. I agree with you. Thank you for that, Phil. Can try and um, push in there a bit, Jaina. That's good, thanks. For folks watching, we're looking at the starboard side of the Akagi aircraft carrier. As we slowly uh, maneuver and coordinate the vessel movement on the surface with the tow sled Atalanta and begin transiting to a position further away from the aircraft carrier and towards 
some of the sonar targets we have as a debris field off the starboard side. But all these changes of direction and given the current and the length of the cable take some time. So it gives us a chance to take an additional look at some of the anti-aircraft weapons from the aircraft carrier and the corrosion, the significant amount of corrosion that's going on. Yeah, this close-up is giving us some really good detail, it looks like. And um, maybe Upashana, do you have more information about um, how rusticles are, I think, microbial? There's microbial activity involved in them, right? Yeah, there's some amount of microbial, microbial activity definitely involved in it. And I think I will also go along with what Hans was suggesting, that probably the uh, degree of fire and degradation on the ship before it started sinking can also contribute towards the amount of rusticles that we are seeing on this particular wreck. The condition in which it sank could have contributed to the current state. Yeah, interesting. I think um, apparently just looking into this some more, there's um, dozens of different microbial species feeding off the iron. So um, very interesting, these kind of unique microbes that are able to take advantage of iron as a food source. Phil, you're right. That's an impressive sight. I think that's the 12 centimeter twin anti-aircraft mount of which there were eight on the aircraft carrier and it's pointed up at where the attacking planes were. Absolutely, Hans, and you know, Im imagining all the eyeballs that were looked in the same direction, you know, and just watching flurry of, uh, of armament that are coming down. I mean, it's a a pretty um, pretty tough reminder of you know some of these horrors that a lot of our fellow fellow humans saw that day. Yeah, I definitely feel this kind of takes us back and puts gives us a view into uh, you know their the viewpoint of the people serving on the ship and who lost their lives so And I uh, just wanted to share that part of Nautilus's mission is to um, include everyone uh, in our exploration and make this uh, science accessible. And in addition to our live stream, we do um, classroom calls to talk about different fields like geology, biology, marine archaeology, and the ocean sciences, and the processes, and careers involved. So. I'll actually be um, jumping off for a little bit uh, to do one of those uh, 
outreach calls to a classroom, and I'll be passing on um, passing my position on to Else. So, um, thank you again for tuning in and uh, enjoy continue um, enjoying this exploration and offering your feedback um, in our comments section. Um, it's great to hear the insights from our community of experts on board the ship, uh, on shore, and um, from our viewers as well. Thank you, Kara. Thanks, Kara. You did an excellent job. So we're waiting on a ship move? Uh, we're still moving, yeah. Roger. Are you ready to uh, spin around here and drop down and uh, see if we can light up your debris field? Okay, good morning everyone, and welcome to our viewers who are just tuning in. We are currently in Papahanaumokuakea National, Marine National Monument, which is uh, located in the northwestern islands of Hawaii and considered a sacred realm for the native Hawaiians. So we are um, privileged to be here. We're currently diving on the wreck of what has, we believe is the Akagi, um, a air, um, aircraft carrier which participated in the 1942 Battle of Midway. And this battle, um, if I'm not mistaken, Hans and onshore team was considered a, one of the most consequential events in World War II. So we continue to explore across this wreck and we welcome any uh, comments in our chat is open, um, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. This wreck is located, we're currently diving at 5,340 meters, and we are using um, Atalanta uh, because uh, Hercules, which we would normally be using, is rated for 4,000 meters uh, and it's uh, quite a bit deeper than Hercules can go. So for Atalanta, um, we are normally when we're diving with Hercules, it would be a two body system. So Atalanta would be above absorbing the movements of the ship while Hercules works below. Because we're diving only with Atalanta, um, that's why you see some of the bobbing up and down on screen. Are those some targets? 75 meters away. Yeah, I think about 70 meters off the beam was the line that I saw. Uh, 
I think those are uh, you know, those only significant targets I'm seeing. So uh, that kind of yeah, I can't promise that they're anything. No, but they're in the in the area of some more bright returns. How far forward on the ship do you think we are now, Mia and Dan? Well, the, the turrets were uh, midships, weren't they? And that's where we came down. Uh-huh. I'll uh, range up one more time and... That's the area of the debris field, but it is about 70 meters out. It is, yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of, you know, shadow in my image, so I don't know what's between here and there, but I know that... It's hard to say, top-down yeah. image, you know? Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, and Nautilus, could you confirm the, uh, the distance of the range on that sector scanning sonar? Uh, the current sonar, um, the range rings are currently 20 meters. Thank you. They change this uh, depending on what we're looking at, but I've just now arranged it up so you're looking out uh, 100 meters. So uh, there's a few hard targets yeah. out here. Yeah. 60 some odd meters away. Yeah. I, I think that's looking like a likely direction. And you can get a sense of where we are on Akagi here with the. Uh, yeah. The debris field, as we kind of interpreted it and understood it, started about 70 meters out from the hull, but continued beyond that, yeah, 80, there's 90, 100 meters out. There's some uh, other targets just at the edge of the 100 meter range ring here. I think we should head in that direction. Roger that. I'm going to... Uh, Turn that lens heading and we'll look directly at that and give us a more accurate uh, bearing. Eight hundred and sixty feet of pasta, is that right? Uh, that were th those were the calculations given to me, Hans. Okay. I like the sound of it. <laughs> and uh, 254 meters. So Hans, just to clarify, I hear you guys talking about a debris field. Are we now turning away from the main hull of the ship and looking around in the surrounding area? We are. We're at, you know, I think the last in our objectives, our priorities. Let's see, we did the descent. Stand by, locate the target, identify in the mapping survey, and confirm the wreck of Akagi. Determine the general conditions of the site, including the general state, sedimentation, currents, and other information. Document the hull or other portions of the wreck. You may determine how it was sunk, areas of high damage. Go west, young lass, go west. <laughs> uh, let's do a 40 meter move and see what happens. Uh, yeah, we, we have some time to. Change the bearing. Yeah, 270. So the hull's been documented in the circumnavigations. We've collected video data. Can um, we please move four zero meters bearing 270? Thank you. So overall, 
um, quite a successful dive so far. Yes, I think so. And we've been able to document a lot of the, the damage, the condition, um, and just have a, gain a lot more insight into what this aircraft carrier looks like after it's sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Yep. We've done the circumnavigation of the wreck at the mud line as well as the upper periphery. We examined the hull for torpedo damage from scuttling. We've moved towards diagnostic features such as numbers, letters, or other markings on the bow and stern. We inspected the hangar and flight deck for bomb, battle, and fire damage. We've inspected other areas above the hull that are damaged, including guns, rangefinders. We've seen some bomb holes in the deck. And the final objective on the dive plan is time permitting, survey the debris field surrounding the wreck for aircraft remnants and other features. And um, yeah, I, I just, just a quick add, you know, a lot of that hangar deck aft is it is missing, um, and I just wonder if this starboard debris field that we're heading towards may have some more clues into that hangar deck construction. I hope so. And I think another important thing we've been able to accomplish with this dive is just bear witness to the wreckage here and maybe contemplate um, what happened, the events of the battle, the history of this ship, and just um, really think about how the, the lives that were lost in this, across this ship, um, just like we are on a ship ourselves. Like you guys said earlier, um, Akagi was four of Nautilus. So maybe there were four people, four, four times the amount of people on Nautilus or more um, who called this ship their home for those months during the war. Just something to contemplate as we continue the survey. Yes, thank you, Elsay. That's, that's been the overall feeling for the whole archeological element of this mission, is um, the recognition that we're looking at something very significant and very tragic. And um, that's, um, why sometimes I feel a little conflicted, you know, about what maritime archeologists do. That's kind of the dark side of the field is oftentimes we end up playing some kind of a curator of tragic locations role. But um, it's important historical data and important archeological data to understand and remember, but also recall that, you know, this was a terrible catastrophic event in the context of a much larger world war. And it, it's hard to imagine, you know, what the the young men of these ships went through at that time, as our colleague in Japan, Jun Kimura, reminded us, you know, thousands of sailors and airmen died, and many of them were young, very young, 20. Um, so I don't think you could say this was an, anything other than, you know, a catastrophic and tragic and sad event. and hope that we don't have to go through any other events and see sites like this. These, these sites are enough to remember that, that level of violence and destruction. Sorry, I got a little dark there. <laughs> no, I think it was appropriate, uh, Hans. Yeah, it's the truth. So. You know, we get excited as we find these things, but yeah. 
I don't yeah. want that excitement to overshadow what you just talked about. Yeah. And I think that is where the importance of maritime archaeology or archaeology in general lies as well, that uh, yes, part of it, the, the main objective is to go and find uh, remnants of past history, but at the same time that also reminds us of the tragic events that they were associated with. And that reminder is, I think, necessary at all at all times given the world we live in that everything has at the, the large prices were paid by thousands of people around the world and we tend to forget those and glorify the other aspects so that's where this comes in exactly well said Apashna. Thank you. i don't you know i mean you know movies are one thing but you know, I don't, I don't see a Hollywood love story here. I don't hear a soundtrack. You know, just the immense quiet of the deep ocean, and we've, we've lowered Atalanta down like a lantern, three miles down to catch a glimpse of this, and it's, it's very moving, very striking. Some of the images we've seen on the previous site, and this site today are, you know, are unforgettable. It's really, really well set. Yeah, a lot of this research has me thinking about the transatlantic slave trade as well, and a lot of those slave ships that have never been um, oh, documented. Or absolutely. It's just amazing how much uh, maritime archaeology there still is left to be done um, and all over the world. Yeah, um, I think for, it's like the tip of the iceberg, right? Like a mm -hmm. little bit of history is found but there's so much that is never found and sometimes it's important to find these to look at the narratives objectively because most of the narratives that exist are biased narratives mm -hmm. so it's important to take out that biasness and look at events as how tragic they were from whatever angle you look at It looks like we've found a little bit of debris, if I'm not mistaken. If uh, It looks like maybe Hans is a little busy, so someone on shore or Hans would like to sort of expand on what we're seeing on screen for our viewers. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a little secret about maritime archaeology. We have all kinds of codes to say things like this articulated piece of something I don't know. <laughs> I think scientific <laughs> jargon 
<laughs> is interdisciplinary. Yeah, yeah very, very important. Um, some sort of piece of grading of. Yes, because we were seeing this kind of grading before on the ship as well, so yeah, definitely from the ship. But I think that's part of the flight deck grading? Yeah, because when we had we first landed, we were seeing these checkered Yeah, there's gradings. a lot of that steel checkered mesh. Does it look the same as flight deck material? Hard to say. Maybe. Bridge nav. Can we please step four zero meters bearing two seven zero? Thank you. So I think our, our aim here, Mia is and Dan is to um, now investigate targets of opportunity in the sonar and not having to keep to a strict mow the lawn swath pattern necessarily but but general coverage in this area does that make sense roger that we are proceeding to the next uh, hard targets there which are yeah thank you 40 meters west yeah they just happen to line up with a bearing of Yeah, Phil and our shoreside investigators as well, you know, we're, we'll be coming across a lot of pieces that we're not going to be able to immediately identify, so any suggestions are helpful. But uh, it often happens that way that we see many things that until we get, until we see more, we, we may not be able to put them in context. What was your word there, Hans? Disassociated. What? <laughs> uh, uh, Whatchamacallit? DMP, disarticulated metal piece. Disarticulated yeah. metal piece. It's a great bit of vocabulary. Thank yeah. you, Hans. Disarticulated. Um, Hans. Yeah, go ahead. Any, any idea on how far into the debris field um, uh, we're thinking about pushing? Uh, no thoughts there, just curious. Right, right. Well, you know, from the images that, that uh, Mike and I were looking at, it looked like it started some 70 meters out, uh, a beam from the starboard side, and and went beyond that, 70, 80, 90, 100 meters, 110 meters beyond that, and in kind of a swath from midships towards the bow, sort of parallel with uh, the wreck of the Akagi. But, um, you know, like Dan says, that's an overhead sonar image and when you're closer to the bottom with, with scanning sonar you get much better fixes on on bright returns and so we're doing a little bit of both sort of moving a little bit systematically through the area while also going to targets of opportunity I think the area for this debris might take up the rest of the dive and, and Mike and I discussed that before he turned in Certainly. Yeah, we're, we're looking at um, a couple more hours on bottom, right? Three or four hours? Correct. Yeah, we're going to be ascending or 
Yeah, it's seven o'clock. Trying to be on deck. And it's 3.42 right now, Hawaiian time. That's the latest plan, subject to change without notice. Yeah, unfortunately, this this soft sediment does bunch up and form a little bit of substrate that sticks up in almost angular pieces. You think they would give us any reflection in those shapes? Yeah, can do a uh, quick zoom there, Jaina. Mm. Good, thanks. Yeah. Let's see. Uh the tail of whatever impacted there. Just a bit more for us. Maybe we'll get a more detail there. Can we zoom? Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's Max. Oh, that's all right. It's okay. We enough imagery there, Hans? Yeah, thank you. Okay, you can go wide, thanks. Turn back around and look the way we're going here.
Let's try uh, 10 at 225, please. Bridge nav. Can we please step one zero meters bearing 225? Thank you. That almost looks like shielding from a gun tub, but, you know, that's just a guess. Looks like disarticulated say. metal to me. I uh, you can confirm that. <laughs> if it was that shield, what, where would that be and what purpose does it, did it uh, have? Well, it protects the, the people who are operating the gun crew, it protects them from damage. But it was simply the shape that reminded me of that. I, I really couldn't say what that was at all. I mean, I imagine some of these pieces may have you know, broken <laughs> off with the impact of the torpedoes. Maybe some pieces were being stripped off as the vessel plummeted to the bottom um, and rained down near it. It's hard to say. Uh, hey, Han. I mean, any idea on if this could be in front of us here, potentially a seat. I mean, I'm seeing hand controls. I'm seeing, you know, maybe a pivot mount based seat. Um, I don't know, any first reactions here? Pushing a bit there for us. No. Mm -hmm. Flat. We zoom in a little further. Yeah. Hmm. Looks like wood to me. Looks like wood to me. It does. It does have a round uh, appearance there at the top. And 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 perhaps consistent with that almost lattice style. To me, wood means support. flight deck. Because we saw those two, the two bases, remember, of, of those style supports for the flight deck. I wonder if this is perhaps from the top. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I went off SPL uh, listening there, so I hope I didn't talk over to you, talk over you too much, Phil. I don't know. There, there are so many buttons in here, it's going to take me a couple of years to get used to this kind of thing. <laughs> I still haven't figured out all the buttons in this room. Disarticulated buttons. <laughs> That's curious. Thank you. That's good. Okay, you go can, wide. Uh, sure, go wide. Video, can you go wide, please? 